All right, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. Uh, what you're going to hear right now is an interview with a candidate who is going to be on the ballot uh, 2012, November 6th. Um, and uh, there, it's not a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, the person's name is Joseph Kexel, and he's running for the Senate race in Wisconsin. And uh, his opponents here, it's Tammy Baldwin, the Democrats, Tommy Thompson, the Republican, uh, which you might sound familiar. He was like in the Bush administration and uh, uh, probably, a, you know, a career politician. Uh, I think they both are actually. But uh, so, Joseph, it's a pleasure to talk to someone that's an option that um, we might not always hear about, although I think, um, you know, the media is slowly acknowledging the other choices, even though they, you know, try to uh, repress um, the, the different options, re, you know, requiring more hoops and hurdles to go through, usually in a lot of different states and the debates and etc. So um, we need to know our all our options to be fully informed and to make the best choices. Joseph, it's a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to join us. If you could please tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, just a brief summary, biography, what got you motivated to be in the race this year, and also, um, you know, just uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, the state of Wisconsin and, and, and I guess the nation, and then the world if you want, and so that's our intro, and, and good uh, good afternoon, Joseph. Well, thank you for having me, Thomas. Um, well, my name is Joseph Kexel. Um, I was born in Wisconsin, Kenosha, in fact. Uh, I have a family here, a house, a small little IT consulting business I do. I um, have about three years worth of college before I uh, left and got into the private sector and working on other projects there. But the main reason I'm involved in this campaign is, is for my children. I, I believe our country is at a serious crossroads. We are going bankrupt. I believe we need to balance the budget immediately, not in 30 years or so that the Republicans suggest, and, and certainly probably never as the Democrats suggest. So they don't see it, you know, you know, some Democrats are starting to wake up to the fact that this really is a problem. But um, historically, the Democrats were not very concerned about deficits, and, and Republicans, they kind of went along too because they, ha they have their own pet projects. And I think it's time to put away the pet projects, balance this budget, and there's some serious things that we have to deal with. I mean, the military needs to be adjusted to a more defensive posture so we don't have our bases all over the world. I mean, some bases might be critical. We might have to keep them, but we need to be honest and say, what do we really need? And if we can bring many of our troops home, we'll save money there. Then we, uh, then that's something I think is quite manageable. We can have a good defense without spending as much money as we do, especially if we stop the nation building and the idea that we're going to be the policemen of the world. Uh, the other couple um, items are the the third rails of politics in America today, Social Security and Medicare. I mean, if you look at those two plus the defense, that's the majority of the budget. That's it right there. Those uh, are I the mean, big three. I mean, everyone talking about, you know, millions of dollars here and there, although those are important and we need to get to them, but, but honestly... If we're serious, we should be talking about the trillion-dollar issues. Oh, well, exactly. I mean, you don't you don't balance your home budget by saying, well, um, we'll, let's, we'll go with a cheaper brand of peanut butter next week. Right. Yeah, I mean, no, you say, okay, what's our big-ticket items? Can we shave some real bucks off? Like, can we change your car insurance? Or, you know, you look at the big stuff. Uh, that's how we have to look at, look at that at the federal level. Now, I think that with the Social Security system, the average person does not take out as much as they put in. So technically, it's not a good system for the individual, but at least it's not totally upside, upside down. The problem with the Social Security system was we, we don't have any money in it because the Treasury borrowed it all, and we spent it on bigger government. So technically, we have to pay that in other taxes to give ourselves our own benefits, which is kind of silly, but that's what happened. I think what we need to do with Social Security is transition to private accounts, now, when I say private, I'm not saying you dump it to Wall Street. What I'm saying is it goes back to the people. You put the money away for yourself. It's for you. That'll take time because we, we can't do it on a dime because we leave too many people unable to take well, care see, of That's the difference between privatizing on a libertarian point of view and privatizing from a um, Republican point of view. The Republican version of privatizing, which they'll try to lump you in with the Republican, unfortunately, but you need to just clear it up because a Republican privatizing means 
uh, corporate welfare, meaning a no-bid contract, giving it to a specific corporation or Wall Street. A libertarian right. privatizing means, you know, we're not giving it to any corporation. It's just, it, it, it really, it's, it's not Whoever not owns even, it, keeps yeah. it. If it's a corporation, fine, it's yours. But, you know, if you break it, you, feel, you get to keep the pieces. Uh, but the thing about the Social Security system, I think, is that that one could be transitioned to, into private accounts. And like, once we do that, the government can't borrow it anymore. It, we can make it sustainable. And if at some point, as a libertarian, I'd say, now that we have it privatized and people are saving on their own, we can do something really radical. We can deregulate. We can say, we don't mandate it anymore. If you want it, you can still do it. We're not going to say, we're not going to pull up a program, but, but Okay, I think it, that's very optional. fair. Yeah, that's a voluntary option. Um, I, I've been interviewing, obviously, hence the title, libertarianprogressive.com, and I, we'll talk about issues that separate um, those two um, factions, but also that unite. And I, right now, in 2012, I mean, we're, like you said, we're in a desperate situation. We need to find some common ground with um, parties that are principled that we can about, like you said, the, the trillion dollar options like the military budget, at least. But I've been looking at, like, what are some common grounds, things that people could unite on um, between, like, just seeing things? Because, I mean, there are a lot of progressives out there and there are a lot of libertarians out there. Um, and But they disagree on, the, the main things they disagree on are um, government programs besides the military and the justice system stuff like that but but the way to bring it all about is what you're saying a fundamental um principle of libertarianism which is on your, you actually have a great video on your website but it basically is i mean you can sum up libertarian in, in one thing basically don't force anyone to, to to do anything i mean that's that's really in a nutshell i mean it's more expansive than that there's actually 10 platform parts to it, but, and they're all kind of more principled things than, you know, going into policy I details. tend to burn it down to something like this. I'd say, first of all, we have to accept that there's uh, intrinsic human rights, including property rights. You own your body, you own your mind, and the fruits of your labor. With those fruits, you can trade voluntarily with others, and then where you get to the nonviolence and no force part comes to the next uh, natural assumption. If I have those rights, so do my neighbor. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that. They think that, okay, so this isn't violating anyone's rights, but the fact is if someone agrees not to um, agree or, um, or participate, they will end up in prison. Well, with the tax system and, and a lot of rules and regulations, yes. I mean, it's not voluntary, so it is force. And I, think he, uh, I think it was um, um, Washington that said, you know, government is not eloquent, it's force. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, it, that's what it is. It's about force. The question is, how much force do we want in our life? I think it needs to be trimmed down. I think this is where I think a lot of Americans are yeah, coming up. Yeah, it's a tool like fire, he also said. It can yeah. be used to, you know, for your benefit, but it can also be a dangerous uh, master as well or something. Yeah, like you have to keep, you got to keep it on control. And we have, we've lost that in our society. We have not been controlling our government. We're letting our government control us. I mean, I mean, the, the, the recent Obama comment, kind of like, you know, we all belong to government. I mean, that's kind of Orwellian, if you think about it. It kind of creeps me out when you say that. Cause well, he, he could, I think we could have said, now, I remember um, the Obama comment, yeah, like we all, like, you know, can give thanks to government for our business success, et cetera, which is obviously false. But, but it's true to some point if you're talking about, you know, a lot of the corporations that got the bailouts. And, um, like, when Dick Cheney, I remember, he was an inter, I mean, a, debate with Joe Lieberman um, in the 2000 campaign and I remember he everyone applauded him when he's like he, Joe Lieberman he, he said something and he came back with yes but then I went to the private sector after I was Department of Defense I was probably one of his first private sector jobs and um, the only reason he did so well with Halliburton is because they got all these no bid government contracts that they didn't yeah. have got so he wasn't like a successful business person no, no. At, at, at all. and uh, crony capitalism. So Obama is right to say, like, if he meant, like, those kind of businesses, then he's right. But if he meant, like, you know, like, you know, like, you, you know, your, your mom and pop shops or, you know, a lot of, you know, even Microsoft or something, then then, then he's totally wrong. It, I guess it depends which businesses he's talking about. Well, if you look at it from a viewpoint of, you know, a lot of people say, well, we have roads, so somehow if there's roads in, in society, somehow the, the business person got this great... Um, hand up from government. But, you know, the roads are for everybody. It's not just for the business owner. It's also for the business customer. I mean, you know, they, they, they always seem to put it all, like, somehow when someone makes a profit, oh, my God, it, 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 it's, it's everyone's, you know, shared income because that person made an evil profit. 
because we have roads. You know, well, the, the people who own businesses, they pay taxes too. They paid for the roads. In fact, business pays for a, a dramatic amount of stuff in our society. Oh, yeah, they do. I mean, every time someone looks at their check and it has uh, federal income tax, Social Security, uh, unemployment, etc., uh, your employer is paying that, plus they're also matching all that for you. So, I, I mean, e you know, even if they didn't have any corporate income tax, they would still be matching your Social Security, Medicare, and et cetera, and, and your federal income tax as well. They match that. Well, so it's, it technically like, is part of your compensation. I mean, this is kind of a, a, a thing, too, because if they didn't have all these things they had to take out, they, that could just be your pure compensation. You know, I mean, they could say, okay, well, we're not going to take anything out to the government because we've got rid of that, and it, it's all yours. So, yeah, that's kind of a question I have for some people that, you know, how much of that, you know, is part of your compensation. They, they know how much they have to pay for you when they hire you, so they, they count that in. But to go further on, well, I think what you asked, how people, how we can bring people together, yeah. I think, you know, the budget issue is, is serious. I think that if we stay on that, we can wake up enough people to realize, you know what, we do have to touch this. We can't leave Medicare alone. We can't leave these programs alone. It just won't last that long, and we're going to lose everything. Yeah, we're going to be owned by, like Thomas Jefferson said, the, the banks will take over. They'll buy everything up for pennies on the dollar. Um, they use the business cycle to their advantage. They sell, like, uh, on, on the way up, and, 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 you know, they buy on the way up at, at, at the peak. They sell right before it crashes because they have inside information, and then, you know, they're left with the, the, as the victor and, and with pennies oh, on the yeah. dollar. Um, and and that, that's that's the, the business cycle. And, um, and and so it is a security concern. It's a national security concern. Um, I mean, the debt really, we're you know, we're, everyone knows the situation. I mean, 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend is borrowed money. And, and right now the interest rate is like less than 1% or, or close to it. If it goes up to like 2 or 3%. Um, it for, becomes a nightmare. It becomes to a point where the the interest payments alone could be the entire federal budget. Yeah, then we're going to start selling off, like, you know, we will have corporate cities, you know, where, where you know, um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, or, and there'll be a lot more desperation. We can end up, you know, if people get real desperate, that's how, like, you know, dictators like, you know, Hitler and Mussolini get elected. Well, yeah, the unstable environment that, you know, economic turmoil causes is very dangerous for any kind of society that wants freedom and, and, and prosperity because it's just almost the antithesis of that. But In it, fact, that's how those societies happen because of big budgets and debts, actually. So. Oh, exactly, because they, they create the problem and, and then some power-mad person just comes in with a solution. So we, I, I'm concerned about that. I mean, I mean, people say it can't happen in America. So you know what? We have these budget problems, and this is something that I think we can unify around for one simple reason. Yes, the so-called liberals, it, you know, I, I respect that they really do care about the poor and the old. But do they care about the future generations? They should tr care about them too. So we have to figure out some kind of proper middle ground on that. And for the conservatives, you want a security force. You want defense. Well, if we go bankrupt, we can't have that either. So I think that, you know, we can have what we need for in this country, but we have to be able to make the point that, you know what, we promised a lot more than we can do. Like we promised the world will be the policeman of the world. We promised the world we're going to be, um, you know... Nation builder. Nation builder. Yeah. It, it's insane. It, re it really is. So I think that the budget is something that's important. I think that the wars could be something we could slowly get people around because even some of the conservatives are getting tired of these wars. They realize we're not having any success. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, nowadays, if 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 no one knew who they were, like if they had to wear like a disguise, if George Washington, um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Eisenhower, Dwight D. Eisenhower, if they were in a Republican debate but disguised, and people just heard what they had to say but didn't know who they were. They would probably boo them off stage, oh, yeah. and then th hopefully they would be ashamed once they revealed their disguises and say, "Hey, you actually just booed George Washington right off the stage." Oh, and, uh, I, I think you're correct in that. I mean, our founders had some really good advice. I mean, if you look at the, the Constitution, this is something I think that's another thing we can we can all kind of join around because I know there's weird interpretation of the Constitution, but we can start saying, "You know what? We have the Federalist Papers. We know what they meant." And, that's the reason why it was put into being, because it does have the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. That's why everyone could agree on it. Whenever anyone's oppressed, the first thing that they say is, you're violating my constitutional rights. Even if it's someone who typically isn't a constitutionalist, that's the first thing that they'll usually say, what about my constitutional rights? But that's, don't forget, though, yeah. it's the 
law of the land. It's the supreme law of the land. So in that regard, it's something we can use to our advantage because it already exists. Most people say they support it, even though you know their interpretations are, could be a little bit different, but at least you have a starting point that, yes, we agree it is the law of the land. Um, and then you know, there's certain things that we, we have. I think one thing I'd like to see change in America is you know, the far-left progressives that really want to go down the socialist path, we've got to get them off the political map because you know, we, don't, we don't need the um, universal poverty that will create. Well, this is what I would say. Here's the, you, you, the thought that I thought of um, that is a unifying thing, is um, if they want the programs, and it's just what you said, I, but I'm just going to say it again. It's, 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 I'm just, because you reminded me of this, actually. It's, 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 if they want those programs, that's fine, as long as it, it's voluntary and it pays for itself. So if someone wants to pay for, out of their own pocket, like a public option for health care, let's say, um, to compete with, you, you know, private health insurance, like, um, and uh, if they can save costs because they can buy medications in bulk because there's no, um, you know, big CEO executive salaries because there's no advertising costs and overhead, if they can get, you, you know, like, and, and also if they feel more comfortable, a lot of people just, I think, feel comfortable that it's a public thing that um, doesn't, that uh, has oversight by elected officials, Although I'm sure a lot of politicians would be trying well, to... Well, to be honest, um, I think we'd be better off if you had a private organization. You say, you know, we'll create our own private consortium of doctors and we'll treat ourselves because... But if you're honest, not forced to pay for it and it's voluntary, then, you know, I would well, say fine. that's the compromise. Let them do it. And, and you know what? You might even have some ideas to make it better. I mean, but, but if, if it's not something you have to pay for and if it's completely voluntary... Then you know what if they, they want to organize that and do that. I I think that's well. That's the, the key thing, though, is that you know people have to understand that. What will your insurance premium be? See, the problem with with uh, most of these insurance scams, I call them scams because for the most part, what they want for this universal well, AIG was a scam. Yeah. Yeah, but for the um, the what do you call it the the universal healthcare concept is that they they want someone else to pay their premium. That's what it's all about. Almost every program is about how do I get someone else to pay what I want. Well, a lot of people don't realize before, like, you know, we, they started making HMOs and stuff, you, you could get catastrophic insurance for, like, $300 a year. And yeah, it was only for the worst-case scenario, and you paid all the rest yourself. In fact, we need to get more to that place again, because when you do that, if you're paying for all the little things, something crazy happens. You yeah, start asking maybe, about maybe price. They, they could have a public option that ends up being a catastrophic insurance because, I mean, it, it is. It, there are a lot of people that do go bankrupt with it. it yeah. Something does need to change. I mean, personally, I would prefer catastrophic insurance. I, I've had it before. With this Obamacare, it's going to get rid of even the option to have. It's going to force me to get rid of catastrophic and it's going to force me to get full coverage, which um, it's going to be kind of hard to afford, honestly, and I don't really want it. Oh, especially now that you have to cover kids at age 27. I'm sorry, a 26-year-old woman or man, they're adults. If, if you need to have that in, built into a, a system, then you're just admitting how horrible your government is because they've totally destroyed the economy. Because to be honest, at age 26, you should be independent. Yeah, and if, if, you're, if you make between like 30000 to about $50,000 a year, um, this Obamacare is not going to help you, um, and um, and in fact, you're you're just going to be paying more. Now, if you make more than that or less than that, uh, you're you know you probably will be helped in a little way, but in the long run, you're not because this is just going to raise the prices. I mean, insurance companies are going to now that they have people that are mandated to buy their products, they're going to work as a cartel and all in, increase them. Um, you, you, you know, kind well, of exactly. Together. Once it's mandated, then they you know they can do whatever they want up to the point. I mean, this uh, isn't even so. This is fast. Fascism. I mean, people, like, one thing conservatives should consider is they shouldn't call Obamacare socialism. They should call it for what it is, is fascism. It's a mixture of corporation and states. Well, I would say in that regard it is because it's not the state taking over. It's the state mandating um, private companies to, um, you know, private individuals to buy 
private company's products. So that, I, I'd say it is more fascism. I agree with you there. Yeah, and, and just like the um, uh, uh, the bailouts weren't capitalism, that was fascism as well. Like so, the Occupy Wall Street people are calling what happened with the bailouts and stuff um, uh, capitalism. That is not capitalism, and Obamacare is not socialism. They both actually are fascism, which is uh, corporate cronyism. And um, yeah, but fascism ultimately is just a stepping stone to socialism because the fascism will destroy the economy enough where people will demand more government control. <laughs> and, and this is why we have to get out of this mindset. You know, we, we have to, you know, like I said before, we have to get away from the, the hard left they are talking about socializing stuff. And we have to get away from the hard right that wants to be all over the world in our, um, you know, with, with our military. You know, we have to find the place in the middle where people understand that, you know what, we have real, real, is real world issues we have to work on now. Well, the hard right, I mean, if you consider our empire, um, that is kind of socialistic in a way, too, because it's subsidizing, you, you know, industries that we don't need. Um, and, and again, we're talking about the trillion dollar issues. I mean, roads and stuff, that's important. That goes to the principle. But honestly, that's not really the debate. I mean, the debate is these trillion dollar issues. And well, the roads have never been a major problem, except for maybe local roads, because usually most states and federal governments have gas taxes that more than fund it. In fact, people, they still they always like to say, well, uh, cars are subsidized because of the roads. You know, but the, the fuel taxes pay for that. In fact, there's so much fuel taxes that they actually pay for a lot of the bus systems and a lot of the train systems. So, I mean, like it or not, a lot of the transportation costs are covered by the use of the automobile and trucks. So it, it's not, you know, no, it's, more of, it's more of a use true. tax. It's not like these taxes, like, like, like for example, I think we have to get rid of the corporate tax. It sounds like overhelping well, about corporations. The whole, but, not just the corporate tax. I agree with you. I think we should get rid of it. It would be a boom to business. We would have oh, an yes. immigration problem of businesses coming to our shores. Like people would be like, yes. God, there's so many business coming uh, over. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it would be great. I mean, imagine this is what we could say to the world. Like, welcome to the United States of America. I mean, not only do you have like the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, it's also the only industrialized country in the entire world where you don't have any income tax. So, I mean, hold your horses. I know everyone's going to be rushing over, and, and people aren't even going to believe it at first. But once they realize it's actually true, we're, I mean, well, the other countries will have to get rid of their income tax to compete with us. A lot of people, you know, th this is what people don't understand. Yeah, this is where you want the world more free, and we become more free. We become the freest country on earth, and we're going to be like... You know, our freedom will be beaming across the entire planet because, you know, like you, like you said, if we have no corporate income tax, now people will say, oh, my God, you're helping the corporation. But realize, a corporation is a piece of paper. It's a legal construct. They don't pay taxes. They push on the cost onto everyone else. They push it onto the shareholders, the consumers. They're, they're already taxed. I mean, every employee they pay... They, they match the federal income tax. They right. match the Social Security, Medicare. I mean, they match that. A lot of people don't realize that. I don't think they just think that, you know, they see their paycheck and think that's it. But there's a whole other side that the corporation has. And then they're being taxed twice, basically, um, w with the corporate exactly. tax. Exactly. And it's hurting us because um, it hurts our exports. So that's it. And what killed me, too, when I first re re researched this, you find out that uh, the corporate tax accounts for about 9% of our revenue. I mean, it's nothing. If we learn to balance our budget, we could cut a little bit more and have the, the corporate tax removal not have any effect on our, our deficits, and we can move forward. Because I'll tell you, this is where people don't understand either. I think that when the government borrows $1.7 trillion, well, you know what? Businesses could have borrowed that $1.7 trillion, but they didn't because the government got to it first. In fact, a lot of small businesses have a hard time getting loans because of those, you know, you because know, even with these low interest rates, well, if I was a bank, they're risky. Why would I? Why would I lend to a business when I can simply just buy treasury bonds that will give me a guaranteed payment of um, a couple oh, exactly. percentage higher than I got the, uh, y you know, my money from my Federal Reserve? Oh yeah, imagine a world with no treasury bonds because we have balanced budgets. Yeah. That would dramatically change the landscape because then, you know, businesses, I mean, even our corporations today, the ones that have all this cash, they don't even know what to do with it because the problem is in order to invest it, you have to have a good investment. And right now with our tax or with our corporate taxes, our complex um, corporate uh, paperwork rules like the Sarbanes, Oxley, and the Dodd-Frank, I mean, it's tough. 
Now, corporations I mean, aren't people, like you said. It is a piece of paper. I mean, it is people in a sense. It's a group of people. Um, right. In some small corporations, there are some individuals that incorporate because of tax purposes. Exactly. And they're kind of more like sole proprietors, like I think um, S corporations. But for the most part, like the big corporations, they, they're publicly traded companies, and uh, more, a lot of them are, not all of them. But um, now, so, it, 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 so you agree that they're, 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 not, they're not people, right? I mean, they, if, if, if they were, they should be able to get the death penalty like people could if they commit, you know, crimes that deserve it. Well, to be honest, I agree with that, too. I, I've always thought that, you know, if you do something that's so atrocious that, you know, you know, the government gave you your, 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 your existence, the government should be able to take it away. You say, you know what, you've committed crimes against humanity, your corporate charter is gone. You're not a corporation anymore. Sell everything off. Because once you had that kind of conviction where you could sit there and have the, a jury take you know, a corporation on to trial and say, you know what, does this corporation deserve to exist? You know, if we had stuff like that, corporations would behave dramatically different. If they knew that they were touchable, that they could just, you know, what, what, what kind of CEO would want to have on his resume that his last corporation was um, destroyed because of his actions? You know, I think that... Right now, it was, you know... And maybe someday people won't even have to even call them. They could just, you know, if I want to start an organization, I'll just name it, and that that's it. I don't need to file any papers or whatever. I just advertise it as so. I'm accountable through the free market. If people want my product, I'll build a reputation. Exactly. I, I mean, mean, hopefully someday we can get to that. I know we're a little ways away from that, but, um, I mean, that would be... I mean, what what would be so terrible about that? I, 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 I No need for nonprofits, no need for corporations, no need to register as a 5013C and all well, of that. That goes to all because of taxes too. I mean, technically speaking, I mean a corporation is just a construct. I mean, I mean people can't even sell a lemonade stand now without like getting in trouble. I mean, should, I mean people. I mean, when we're talking about the free markets, I think you mean like just letting the floodgates open, letting people just go out and, and you want to you, you know in your own house you want to start a computer business you want to start this or that you want to sell T-shirts on the side of the road. If we had a free market. People do not understand. We'd have so much prosperity. You know, that's what that's what made America's wealth originally. We were the closest to a free market you could get because, you know, they, were, they always started making laws. But when we first created the Declaration of Independence and then the Constitution, well, that's pretty much it. Yeah, but nowadays people like I mean, if you want to be a hairdresser at your own house, I mean, most of these are state laws, but you have to go through these hoops and hurdles because. The other hairdressers in your community started a, um, a, a a trade union or something, which they they forced you to take like a one-year class or something like that, which you might not even be able to afford, even though you might be the best hairdresser. Well, and I'm just using well, that well, as an example. Well, well, the worst one is the hairdressing issue when it comes to braiding hair. Yeah. You're using no chemicals. You're using your, your fingers to braid someone's hair. You, they still force you in many states to have a full-blown hairdressing, which means you have to learn all about dyeing hair. and So you learn about everything, but guess what? They don't have in that actual coursework. And you probably have to pay for it, and also time is money also. And oh, on. yeah. And plus, I think there's actually one community where, oh, what was it? I can't remember. There was some, like, particular profession that you actually had to get permission from others in your profession before you actually opened. Right, from your competitors. Um, and that's insane. Yeah. I mean, that's not a free market. I mean, that's crony capitalism, government keeping out competition. With competition, people have to realize you'll get lower prices, higher quality product. I think it'll be easier to sell, I mean, a, a, once we get rid of some of so I think there has to be, like, I agree with, like, I, I agree eventually our end goal will be to have a society where, you, you know, we live by the golden rule, basically, and and, um, and people are mature and responsible. But I do think in order to get there, um, we have to do it in the right order. I mean, we can't just, you, you know, uh, you, you know, um, like, uh, have an unequal playing field like all of a sudden like you know um just uh end social security medicare while the other companies and stuff are getting their bailouts and stuff we need to end the cronyism first set up the um you know and then people will be more accepting of free market insure property i would say rights, um i agree with you there the you know we have to address the uh, the, the cronyism first on you know, your business you should have no government bailout period i mean that that almost needs to be a constitutional menace you know what the federal government will not bail any company ever again and then i think like i said i plan to balance the budget then we can look at um, reducing um the budget a little further for a surplus instead of paying off the debt because I think if we balance the budget that in itself will boost our economy because like I said all this money investors will have and 
it'll send a message to the market that we're serious actually right yeah i mean china india um germany um brazil all those countries will be like whoa um uh, like one of our main um you know pe people in the market here the united states looks like they're getting their house in order um it looks like you know maybe we should start investing there again it looks like they're getting serious i mean that actually i think it would be a very positive sign we might even increase our credit rating again and well oh, I, I agree with you i mean i i, but I think also it, we sent a message to the people that we need you to be productive anyone who just like i'm sorry productive. just like if you're in like uh, you know um researching a stock and, and if you see that they're like, you know, $16 trillion in debt, but all of a sudden if you're researching a stock and you see for the last year that they've cut their debt in half and, and they're getting back to success, that might be a stock you might want to buy compared to, you well, definitely yeah. aren't going to buy one that it doesn't care about their deficits because you know you're going to lose money and they're going to go out of business. Well, exactly. I mean, right now we're seeing the, the more protests in Greece, so I, I don't want that to happen to America. I mean, this is where we're at right now. We cannot do what we're doing now because it's not sustainable. That's the big thing we have to sell to the American public. You know what? It can't keep going. Social Security is the best. I mean, Medicare is the quickest one to, to review. For every dollar you put in, you're expecting three dollars back. And imagine that 10,000 people retire today, 10,000 will retire tomorrow, and 10,000 more every single day for the next 18 years. Well, here's that an can't work. Thought. I mean, besides a public option, we we need more. Like um, I think. Um, like um, more um, clinics and stuff like that. And, and I wouldn't be totally opposed to like, you know, just kind of like the military, we, you know, they get a GI Bill, maybe for doctors, like if, if they get a, a doctoral education, maybe they can, you know, um, and this might be more at the state level actually, but, um, but th maybe they would have to serve at a hospital for four years and then they can do whatever, open up their own private practice. or but That's or, something or I agree with you. At the state level, I think we can look at those different ideas because now, do you think some states, what if one state does want to have like a, you know, single payer? Do you think a state would have a right to experiment with that? Absolutely. The, the rights, uh, the, you know, the Constitution strongly limits the federal government. In fact, the 10th Amendment pretty much tells the federal government, if you haven't already gotten permission to do it, you don't have it. I mean, I don't we, think we they should it. still be able to mandate, I mean, or I think that's debatable, but... Um, but 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 it, it is kind of good to have 50 laboratories of freedom. You know that way, not all your Most eggs are definitely. in one basket, and you can learn. A lot of states do learn stuff from other states. Like they'll see how it works for five years, and then they'll be able to take the good and leave out the bad. I mean that happens a lot. There is a lot of coordination that does happen. It happens like, in the private sector too. I mean, yeah. when, you, when someone has a great campaign and and they're doing well, all the competitors are saying, hmm. And guess what? States are competitors. They have to compete with other states. So that this is why mostly people say it can't work that way because the laws would be all crazy. It doesn't work that way. What ends up happening is the really good ideas, you start to converge on it because the fact is no state can afford to be the tax with the, the state with the highest corporate income tax, right. the highest taxes, the lowest job potential. I mean, everyone will leave your state because, you know, people can move across. But that's the one thing I think that's nice, nice about the, um, the federal constitution. Pretty much it says you can go anywhere you want among the states. Now, while we're being distracted with like um, issues like roads and stuff by the Republicans and Democrats, and I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not for debating that out, but 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 they're, they're, that's what they're focusing on is what I'm saying. While we have these crises going on, oh, they're, yeah. they're arguing about roads, um, which which, which uh, you know I don't even have time to argue about that right now. We were talking about like huge, you know, earth changing things here, like trillion, you know, sixteen trillion. Oh, like let's say Medicare. I mean, Medicare is so upside down that it needs to be addressed now. And like I said, most people did not put enough money in to really cover all their um, coverage as it is today. We're basically the federal Should government. Should um, would a free market allow buying prescription drugs from Canada? Hell yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, for example, in fact, I want to see more free market in everything because I think free market that drops prices. People don't realize that LASIK surgery and cosmetic surgery they don't have the type of insurance coverage for those procedures. And guess what? Over the last 20 years, they've dropped between 20 and 30 percent, and the quality of the care has gone up dramatically. So you get more value in a free market. So that's one way we could save um, uh, the Medicare issue or helping the elderly. Just looking at the health I mean, the whole, there could be technologies that, that we, we don't even look at the health care. Prevention's a big thing now. Of course, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to see people with like two elbows because they had a broken arm or whatever, but, um, but uh, it, it, you know, there's, um, 
we need to look at healthcare totally differently. I mean, maybe even like what would it be like, you know, without insurance the, the way it is? I mean, maybe more of a catastrophic, like you said, that would be more reasonable. Well, um, I think if you had catastrophic and you kind of paid your way, I mean, there's always a room for a state government to have programs for the, those who have horrendous sicknesses. I mean, I mean there is a, an area for compassion, but the compassion needs to be close to the problem. Yeah, and that's See, not the place where you're going to, like, try to, you know, uh, b balance the budget over. I mean, right now we're talking about, like, you know, Medicare and, and the military. I mean, those are the two. Oh, buddy, those are big ones. And like I said, though, that, that we have to redefine them. Like I said, the military has to be re redefined as a defensive force for the mainland. And there's a lot of cronyism going on in the FDA, too. I, I mean, who knows, like, what could open up in medicine if we had a free market. There's a lot of companies, just like the hairdressers, it, 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 that's oh, exactly. the same thing's going on in the FDA. Like, we, you know, it costs, like, a billion dollars just to even approve a prescription well, for drug. example, look at cell phones. Cell phones had this dramatic change, and, and aside from the, um, the licensing of the of the radio waves, the government couldn't get involved in that. And it dramatically changed. It went from something that was the size of a huge box to something you hold in your hand. It went from something that it would cost you like $500 a month just to rent the phone, let alone the $2,000 for the service. And now everyone can have it. So that, that's where innovation gets it cheaper and better, and the FDA gets in the way of that. Plus, I saw something just Plus recently. Plus, people should be able to experiment. Like, there's a lot of restrictions, and I'm sorry, to, like Ron Paul said one time, like, as a doctor, he thinks that a lot of nurses should be able to, you know, work as freelancers or whatever and, and do a lot of these processes that you oh, exactly. have to go to a hospital. Because I think um, that... I mean, um, that, I think, is a great idea, and, and that just shows the example of, like, you know, we're not even scratching the surface of, like, what a free market could be like. Yeah, nutritional, um, nutritionists should be able to um, diagnose disease, especially when, when they can be trained on that. So I think that we have to kind of get rid of the monopoly on doctors, too. I mean, at some point, we have to get it where the, we have a real free market where ideas can come from all over the place. I mean, in the future, you might be able to just, I mean, they're saying now that you could probably go to a computer terminal, type in, have them ask you questions. They could, they could probably do a better job diagnosing than some doctors do. You know, and, and that's... Yeah, and a lot of them are just trying to sell you prescription drugs, to be quite honest. Oh, exactly. So this is where we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn. But the free market, I'm not afraid of it, but a lot of people are. And that's why we got, as libertarian-minded people, we got to help people understand the free market is amazing. It works in such mysterious ways, but guess what? It gives you value for your dollar. And that's what we need to save I Medicare. Think, and I think the compromise is allowing people to create that public option if they want. It's voluntary. It pays for itself. And it'll, it'll cost whatever it costs to run it. I mean, basically. And well, I think that if we had the cost pushed down on the individuals, you would move to catastrophic care almost instantly. Yeah, I, that, I think that would happen as well. Um, and, uh, and, and then then, you know, people could have health savings accounts for the deductible, and, and that's the whole purpose of that health savings account. It's not just a health savings account itself. It's only really supposed to act as the deductible or anything that costs below that amount, and, um, and so that's true insurance, um, and it could be a lot less expensive, you know, being able to be uh, across state lines and, and et cetera. And Real competition, and, and I think that there's a lot of things. I mean, for example, right now they have these little things with your car. You put this little box in your car, they check what kind of driver you are, and they and they figure out your rate. Well, who knows? They might be able to do that with people. They'll be able to say, you know what, if you allow us to monitor this and, and you can, if you lose 10 pounds in the next six months, well, we'll give you a better deal. I mean, there's a lot of great creative ideas that where insurance companies would no longer just be writing checks. They might say, okay, you want a better deal? Here it is. You have to lose 25 pounds. You have to have your cholesterol level with this. Now, I'm not saying it's mandated. It's up to the customer. The customer says, I, I want a no questions asked policy. Well, fine. You'll pay more for that. Yeah, and, and if, if doctor or, or nurse um, or, you know, someone who's, who knows how to do it that has a good reputation by the free markets, um, because, like, just like shopping at Amazon.com or eBay, I mean, if this person has a good reputation, I'm not going to have someone fix a broken arm that doesn't know what they're doing, but if they're a local person where I can just go in and pay cash, and, um, and I can sign a form, you know, that uh, for, for like tort things, I, I don't need a law about that. But if I wanted a good price, I could make my own decision or I could go to a hospital if I had insurance. But I think there would be a lot of 
services available that wouldn't even exist now, you know, because it, it, it again, again, it doesn't have that monopoly guarding it. And now with this mandate that we have with the um, private insurance companies that we all bailed out and, and a lot of people detest, um, you know, for lots of reasons. I mean, I don't, you know, I like the free market, but I, I don't really have too much compassion for these insurance companies, to be quite honest, and um, especially once getting bailed out. Um, and uh, they could, what if they said, now that you have a mandate, in order to keep these rates, we're going to force you to take these um, preventive steps. Like, you have to take this kind of vaccine. You have to do this and that in order to maintain your insurance, because after all, we have to keep costs down, um, or we're just going to really jack up the prices. And I, I, I just see that as a possible something that could happen in the no, future. I, and then I, they I, could I, force you guaranteed. to get biometrics. What if they said in order to have this insurance, you know, so we can process you quicker at any hospital, you know, we want an eye scan and, and, and a retina scan as well. I mean, that's... that's or chip yet. Yeah, I mean, that, that's coming. I mean, I, uh, this is why a libertarian philosophy needs to be learned by the American public because... Oh, it, you can only have a free society when things are voluntary. You cannot have a free society if the government can say, you got to buy insurance, you got to do this, you got to do that. That's not freedom. I it's mean, real freedom is, like a long time ago, people could just head out west and then just build right there, wherever they found it, and build a whole town. I mean, we don't have that ability anymore. That's what real freedom is. I think a lot of people have forgotten about that. Go out head out west, like just, you know, take it easy one day instead of these pressures of life and just sit by a lake and fish or whatever and, um, you know, build a nice house, something that might have be solar powered or whatever. It, it's, I mean, that that's what real freedom is. And um, and that is something, you know, uh, that, that I think um, might be forgotten in conversation too. I mean, there isn't that sense of freedom a anymore. I mean, nowadays you probably get fined by the EPA f for like, you know, $50,000 a day or something. And uh, Well, um, yeah, if you shovel a piece of dirt into what they call wetland, boom, you know, now you've damaged the wetland. There's a, and, and again, I mean, th this is where, you know, we, we have too much government. That, that's the problem. That you can't do anything now. For example, the best example of too much government is when these little kids open up their lemonade stand and they get shut down. What is that telling that entrepreneurial spirit of that young child? Don't bother. Yeah, and it, it's the misery loves company, and um, it's we have a lot of miserous, and um, we just have elected. The, I mean, it's our fault too because it is we the people, and um, and for those who are completely like thinking that not voting is the solution. I hear you, um, and I think not voting for Republicans and Democrats because the real anarchists are, they're already in charge. I mean, we already have the anarchists in charge. It's just that they're using that philosophy for evil instead of good because they ignore the laws as if they don't even exist. They, they pass things like the NDAA, which are, you know, an abomination to the Constitution. I mean, they violated their oath by, you know, voting, whoever voted for that. And oh, I know. You know, they're throwing habeas corpus under the bus. Um, I mean, that's just, I mean, I think habeas corpus exists even for non-citizens. I hate to, you know, yeah. I, I say that people get nervous because, you know, well, these are our rights. Well, first of all, almost the entire first ten amendments of the United States are human rights. They have nothing to do with, you know, specifically, granting rights to you from the government. This it's the most technologically, of, morally advanced, um, you know, document that we have as of yet. I mean, well, yeah, but but it doesn't give you your rights. You already have them. All the all the yeah, it's the amendments that, that is, they already exist. Yeah, yeah. But they they just said you know. By the way, federal government, we we already know we have these rights, and you're not touching them. <laughs> you know, we these are the ones that we've already said we claim these. You know, you can't you can't touch them. You know, yeah, we let them touch them. I mean, the whole point of I mean, uh, the Patriot Act. I mean, geez, they're into everything. I mean, right now, I mean, everyone's being spied on all the time. They're using Facebook at, a, at an unbelievable level to spy on people. Yeah, at the same time, they're more secretive um, at, at record levels. Like, we, you know, we don't have freedom of information. If we don't have freedom of information, how can we make, um, uh, you know, uh, relevant choices? So I would say if we don't have the information, the best thing to do is to vote no. I mean, I'm not going to sign something that I haven't read yet. Um, if I had to pick a default position, it wouldn't be yes to something like that. It would be no, no to the Republicans. Democrats. They have a 10% approval rating. We need that 10% approval rating that's in the Gallup polls to reflect actually in the Congress itself. If we had true representation, there would only be 10% Republicans and Democrats in the Congress. And um, Oh, I know. 
and, and we have a lot of work to do, I'm sure. But like I said, I'm running um, for the Senate race because, like I said, we got to save America. I got children. I, I worry about their future. So. Um, it comes down to that. Well, while, while they're debating, you know, roads and stuff like that, what about, um, you know, our highest incarceration rates of uh, uh, more people in jail than any other country um, that are, uh, you, you know, that's also corporate cronyism, I think, um, to some degree. And um, well, so, that's mostly due to the drug law. And as a libertarian, you own your body, and the government should not tell you what you can or cannot put in your body, be it um, pharmaceutical drugs, you know, so-called illegal recreational drugs or, um, you know, nutrients. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, if I told you, you know what, you can't eat a piece of bacon, most people would say, you're, you're, no way, the government can't do that. But the bacon probably isn't healthy for most people. So, I mean, why can't the government say, bacon's not healthy, you can't eat that anymore? You can't force others to eat bacon, that's for sure. And um, so, I mean, just as long as you're not forcing others to eat bacon, you know, go ahead and eat your bacon and uh, well, I mean, exactly. what about people parachuting I mean skydiving I, I mean you know are you going to stop people from skydiving oh, well, jumping well, out of well, a plane exactly. at I like mean, 20,000 well, feet so you, this is something I got from one of, one of, one of my associates of mine you know, you know, what, you know freedom is essentially chaos now it's not chaos in a bad way it just means you can't control everybody why try then that's what we have to learn because for example the, the drug laws have we stopped drug use in America no which means we're wasting billions of dollars of precious tax money, we're incarcerating people and ruining their lives. Because, you know, you get a, let's just say you have too much marijuana on you, you get this felony bus, now you're virtually unemployable the rest of your life. Yeah, and what if you were married, and what if you had kids? Oh, I know. And, and the thing about this, too, about the whole, you know, having too much of a drug on you, well, how can you have too much of an illegal substance? The whole point of an illegal substance means that the government's preventing you from buying it, so you can't assume you can go to the store next week and buy a pot. So if someone has an extra pot to sell you and you got the money, you might buy it. Now, how come it took an amendment to make the prohibition of alcohol legal, but it didn't take a constitutional amendment to make uh, marijuana legal? Well, that's because of um, the, the interpretation of the Constitution. Which the but just federal a few government years before, they had to make an amendment for the uh, alcohol. Right. I mean, so... But see, that shows you the change in the mindset of the American people. They accept these intrusions by government. And second of all, the Supreme Court has done us a great dis disfavor by manipulating the meaning of the general welfare clause. I mean, the, the whole point of the general welfare is that you, you promote the general welfare by having sound government. You have balanced budgets. That's how you promote the general welfare. Promoting the general welfare is not getting out the checkbook and writing every sob story a check. I mean... Right, especially the ones that just lost um, hundreds of billions with uh, uh, derivatives and things like that. And um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's not the general wel welfare. I mean, that's like uh, special interest welfare. Um, and yes. uh, it, that, that's what it's supposed to prevent. I mean, you don't want competitors having to give money to their own competition. I mean, that's the most unfair thing that could ever happen. And uh, I, it's like McDonald's giving money to Burger King or, or vice versa. And um, well, A good example is the bailout. I mean, from what I've read, Ford was in a pretty good position going into that situation. If GM would have went away, Ford could have had a great opportunity yeah. to, to grow. Yes. You know, yes, and they never got that opportunity because their tax money, which they paid, is bailing out the competitor, which made horrible. And honestly, we're also bailed out the unions. This is where unions have to get smart, too. You cannot destroy the goose that lays the golden egg. There's a point where you can ask for so many benefits from your employer that you kill it. And when your company goes down, then own it. You killed it with, with too much. You made your employer uncompetitive in the world markets, and you lost. See, that's how people learn. But the now, you do agree with the, you know, at least the private sector's right to assemble peaceably and, and, and be unionized, but you're just saying that just as, like, kind of um, more of a message, right? Sort well, unions are completely within your freedom. But you don't get to have government do special favors you for you, like force the employer to deal with you. To me, that's where, see, any time the government starts picking... Um, but uh, people do need to realize, I mean, it's, you know, if, if they have a good business that they're working for, I mean, it would be, you know, if, if it's easier on the business to not have to pay certain taxes and stuff like that, and, and if that will benefit you, um, then, uh, 
you know, that's a consideration people have well, to yeah. consider. Yeah. So, like I said, there's a lot of stuff we have to do. There's so many little wrinkles of our country that needs to be ironed out. <laughs> yeah, and of course, like the Second Amendment, I'm sure you agree with that. But, but I mean, these Democrats, they, they don't, like, do you, people don't realize that the Emancipation Proclamation freed about 200,000 people. I think a little bit less than that is what I've read. And um, <clears throat> ending the drug war would free even more people than that. Oh, oh, the, oh, the drug war, I think, we, we could, there's so much savings, there's so much benefit yeah, and industrial to get these hemp. people but, out I mean, there. But we're saving people. I mean, it's just, I mean, this is a moral issue, just kind of like um, slavery was. Um, and, and I'm not comparing it to slavery. I mean, that was like a lifelong um, thing of to torture and stuff like that. But, but this is um, people that are in prison, which, you know, that's a pretty bad situation to be in that have done victimless crimes um, exactly yes. like I said I, I agree with you 100% there we got to work on that the, uh, the public has to understand it certain moral issues the government can't so solve. people have a choice I mean they can either yeah. vote for someone who will work on that honestly and um, a, or they can vote for someone who won't they can either vote for someone who sees us I see as a republic instead of an empire or you know who's in line with like Dwight D Eisenhower or or, or, or they can vote for two other candidates that won't I I mean, they can vote for, you know, someone who's, you know, willing to stand up to the special interests and have an honest debate and uh, and want more fair and honest, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I mean, if you're against or for these things that we just mentioned, I mean, you probably, you know, are concerned about privacy and our civil liberties, or we can have someone who, who, who won't. Or you could continue to argue about roads and, 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 and stuff that is like in the million dollar range when we're talking about these big fundamental issues. Well, for example. That's the choice we have this November 6th. I mean, you are in position if people want, and, and if they don't like you after six years, hey, I mean, at least we... Well, exactly. You know, I mean, I, I kind of kind of go with the, you know, the Gary Johnson thing. Vote libertarian with me once. I bet you'll be surprised how, yeah, just, <laughs> how painful just it is. Just one year, yeah. Be, be a libertarian with me just this one time. Just, you know, this one time, you know. Let's get For example, back. though, in a libertarian society, people don't understand how incredibly nonpartisan it would actually be. Because if the government's not involved in everything, you won't be fighting with your neighbor over everything. A libertarian society would be very, very quiet. Because you wouldn't be able to go to your congressman and say, can you get some money and give it to me? And the congressman would have to say, no, we can't do that. Yeah, you know? people have to see the big picture. They're all, if you're only seeing one side of it, um, then, uh, then yeah, it, it could be like, you know, you could imagine like, you, you, you know, power accumulating in certain pockets of the nation. Um, but, I mean, if you think about it in a way of, of more fully where you have all the rights we're not just talking about like half the rights um so it's still an unequal playing field but where it's a complete equal playing field where the only way a company can make money is if they voluntarily uh, received it um which is a whole lot different um than now uh then um i mean that's a different situation but plus i mean you know the government is there to protect our civil liberties to protect all of our constitutional rights i mean yeah if, but the key thing is that we're equal under the law no one gets a special deal unions shouldn't get a special deal and companies shouldn't get a special deal i mean just deal. those issues by itself i mean just equal justice under the law the empire spending yet having a strong military, um, a stronger military, and um, the senseless um, uh, drug policy that's uh, unconstitutional. Well, unlike the, the marijuana one is something that more people, I mean, we're, I think we're over the 50% mark now on that. People, uh, people are saying, you know what, this is just yeah, and civil making liberties. no sense. I mean, if, 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 you, if, if you just made an impact on those four issues alone, I would say it'd be more than worth voting for you. I mean, those are issues that the Democrats and Republicans aren't even going to touch. Oh, exactly. You know, I'm, I'm for getting back to true um, liberty, which means I want to give back your property rights. You, you own your body, and you own your mind, and you own the, the, the fruits of your labor. I mean, if you got that back, you, you won't be poor for very long. If you are poor, you won't last very long that way, because if you're, if you're allowed to start a business, for example, you're in the inner city, and you want to start breaking hair for money. If you don't need a license, you can start that business tomorrow. Yeah, or if, or if you want to build solar, do you think you should have to have a permit for that? Um, and, no. Um, and, and what if you want to, you know, have a hairdressing business and solar power? Um, I, I mean, you could do it all, and uh, just as long as you're not hurting anyone else. Um, exactly. And polluting That's the key into your thing. neighbors and stuff like that. But if imagine if people could be that free 
to do if they could be that free like do you think um along with that it might be a good idea I, some people disagree with me on this but i think to have to, to to really sell it um i mean we should get rid of property taxes too um and, and that way people have well, uh, extra uh, security all the, like i said the, the 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 biggest trouble we have with taxes is that we spend too much if you shrink down government, then the need for taxes get get lower. Then you can start getting very innovative. I mean, you could probably go to a pure, simple sales tax. Yeah, I agree. A sales tax would be the easiest way. Um, but right now we can't. For example, if we get rid of the IRS, people okay. don't understand this, virtually all the income taxes in America goes away, even at the state level, because virtually every state, they piggyback off the federal government. Yeah, uh, but Ron Paul made a point in 2008, and this I know is four years ago, but he said if we had gotten rid of the income tax completely, we would still have the same spending levels, and this was in 2008, as um, I think he said like 2002 or something like that. So there's still a lot of revenue even without the income tax. Oh, exactly, exactly. And like I said, in a free society, like I said, if people can get businesses started quickly, for example, I had my little consulting business. That was the last question I asked myself before I started. Do I want to deal with the IRS? Am I willing to deal right. with that nightmare? And I had to think, you know what? I'd I'll rather do it. go to an accountant and, and, and have them, like, it takes some of the responsibility because I'm so scared that, you, you know, of an audit or something yeah, like I, that. Imagine if you didn't have the fear of the IRS. How many people would have started a business? And what if we didn't, and for example, I live in a community where every time a business comes in, the city council goes in there and, and tries to tell it how to run it, and we, we're going to do this and we'll do that, and if you don't sell enough stuff, we're going to pull your liquor license in six months and all this crazy stuff. for the stuff. poor and stuff, I think, you know, what, maybe, I mean, I, I, I would be serious. I think we should have a constitutional amendment to ban property taxes because there are people losing their houses and, and that would give them the security i think that could you know put the um over the top because if you if you can be assured that you know no one can take your property you, you know except for the rare occasions if they need it for what whatever i think that's allowed but well, that's would something i think we're clear. getting down into the state level there because most of that is done at the state and county level yeah. um but this, you know the, the federal government is, is kind of a weird one for me too um like, I would like to see some constitutional changes. I'd like to see the removal of the 16th Amendment, the income tax. I'd like to see the repeal of the 17th Amendment, because I think the, the senators are really supposed to be representing the state government. So when the federal government does a mandate, the state governments can, governments can say no. And for the poor, maybe we should open up some property that's owned by the government and say, you know, give people or sell people or whatever lots of land as individuals so they can buy like, you know, um, well, like honestly, up to an acre or half an acre. Or the federal government owns is. a lot of property. I, I would say it might be time to get that out into the public domain somewhat. So that could be an economic boost. And, and I think that, you know, we have to allow um, like energy research in our own country. And, and it's just... A free society, is, we would have so much prosperity, people, I mean, the immigration would never be a problem ever again, because we, we'd be like begging people to come here, could be like, we'd have so many jobs, so much productivity, we'd like, you know, in fact, at one time, people would actually leave their homeland to come to America, they knew their business would be better in America than in their home country, so they came here, I mean, there's actually, I read articles about some people talking how they came to America, and, and, they, and they said, you know, they came over and started a business. The whole plan was to start a business. And nowadays, people are going to Canada. They're going to um, New Zealand. They're going oh, yeah. to other places, Singapore. America. And, 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 uh, and, and lots. So, I mean, that's the, you know, Einstein came to America you know, for different reasons, but also because, I mean, he could have chosen any other place. He came here. Um, a lot of people came here. Um, Nikola Tesla, I think, came here. And There's we need to be that again. We need to get back to a free society where everyone says, you know what? There's only one place in this world you want to be. You either want to be in America or you're going to make your country just like America. Yeah, <laughs> and I that's what we have to be. And, and like I said, that's why we had to go back to our founders a little bit. I think what happened, we've gone down the, the wrong road too far. It's time for us to take a good look at ourselves and be honest and say, you know what, we can't afford all this stuff. The military is going to have to change. Medicare is going to need drastic changes. I mean, phenomenal changes because economically fiscally it's impossible and people should be allowed to build i mean i could imagine like you know what if there were homeless people like what if they could go out like the wild west and build a whole city what if they could use the natural resources and donations and, and help from communities or around them and, and just build up a whole new city that doesn't have to be registered or chartered or, or whatever i mean it can be eventually there's later so many interesting ideas there, there is uh, the, the, I mean, there's so much out that there happen nowadays it's going to be some contractor who who knows everyone on the council 
and um, yeah. and they're going to get a special deal. And um, so I, I I mean the the main thing is I mean new laws when they're passed they they should be thought of to expand freedoms instead of restrict them. So I, I wouldn't have a problem with you know getting rid of some of these things even at the local level as long as it's expanding freedom instead of restricting it. Well, yeah, I um, think that you know, a lot of people are afraid of you know what if I can't make it, but the fact is. Charity is strong in America. Americans give more to charity than most countries, and, and that's even with uh, a very high tax rate. Because I mean, you, if you put all your tax together, we pay a tremendous amount of taxes. So imagine if you had more taxes to give to, to charities. And I think charities are also powerful too, because you know people say, well, you know, we, we don't want charities because you know there's a stigma with going to charity. Well, you know, I don't think so. I think that, well, we I think there should be a stigma of going to government because government is forcing well, your people's neighbors. What are biggest expenses? It's housing. It's food. Um, it's um, energy and, and, and energy and education and health. But yeah. so if we can reduce prices for at least some of those areas, like you know, grant lots or sell lots to individuals instead of big corporations, and you know what, if they had like a half an acre or, or something, um, th then it's not going to be built up. It's not going to be like polluted. They'll probably take really good care of it if it's like an individual, um, and um, they might even be able to start a small business on it. They would be able to, um, y you know, build on it, and uh, um, they might even. Um, uh, it, it's. I mean, it, it would prevent a lo lot of this poverty. They, 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 they could do whatever they wanted on it, basically. And um, I, 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 there's the thought I had in there somewhere, but uh, I guess kind of lost it there. But well, is there um, any um, campaign events? Um, that uh, is coming up soon. Any debates that you're going to be in? Well, getting into the the regular debates are hard. Uh, what I am doing, I am doing a, an event tomorrow night in Milwaukee. I'm going to pretty much answer all the questions of the official debate about a mile away from the official debate, and I'm going to tape it all and I'll get it on. I'll get it online so people will know my answers, and I'm going to make sure I show to uh, the people that you know I was a mile away from the debates. It wasn't because I wasn't willing to be there. I wasn't invited. Well, that's an excellent idea. Um, and then and I got some that. coming up probably later in the month. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do a road trip up to like Green Bay and area and, and try to get more contact up there. So, uh, And next um, Thursday I'm going to be in Sheboygan at the Liberty uh, Sheboygan Liberty Coalition. Uh, they have a meeting up there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm getting out a little bit. I mean, this is more than I've ever done for a campaign. I mean, I've run for um, U.S. Congress twice. You know, but those campaigns are kind of small, so it's not quite the same. But it's a big learning experience. I'm happy I did it. It's um, it's exciting to be able to get out, and so many people I've learned are learning about Ron Paul and libertarians. I mean, Ron Paul has helped our country dramatically. He got the message out. He he seated even the Tea Party. Now, the Tea Party, some of them are still really Republican-minded, but a lot of them are, are, are going further because they realize there's something wrong in the Libertarian, in the, in the Republican Party, and they're discovering it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and he's getting, he, I mean, uh, I know some pundits um, try to put him down, um, and, and he's not perfect, of course, he's a politician, but... He is great. I mean, he. I mean, he, and he's like a truth teller, and um, and and he has gone around the entire country. I mean, this summer, and I mean, he was going to campuses like from the East Coast to the the middle, to um, it, you know, in Wisconsin. I saw that speech that he did, um, and uh, and in California, all all around Kansas, um, New I would York. Say... I mean, he had thousands of people show up. Where Mitt Romney, they put the cameras in so close, so you you, you think you only see the front row, and and and. and, and and and, um, and 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 if you looked in the background, you, you know there's crickets and. Oh, exactly, exactly. And, and this is thing you have to understand is that, you know, Ron Paul has done us a great service. I think he's a real hero because he's like the Johnny Appleseed of liberty. Yeah. He's spreading all these seeds all across the country, and they're taking root. I, I, a lot of the college campuses, I get a lot of support from those type of people because you know they're looking at it. I mean, there's some liberal-minded people there, but there's a lot more liberty-minded people, or at least people willing to look at, you know, you know, is this government program actually solving the problem or not? I mean, and that's what we have to get to. We, well, we, have, we have to fix it. We have a lot of work to do, and, and like I said, I would love to be the next senator from Wisconsin, but we'll just have to see what happens. I know uh, the Republicans, um, I got some call from Republicans even. They're not very excited with Tommy Thompson, so 
I don't know how it's going to turn out. I wouldn't be too <laughs> excited about him. Um, I, I mean, it's seriously, um, but it's kexel 2012com kexel 2012 I should say, .com. And, um, I mean, it, it's uh, we can have, a, a, I would say, you might not agree on everything, um, but uh, the big issues like um, the budget, which represents the empire, which also represents the drug war and the, the civil liberties abuses. Yes. I, I mean, we would have a stronger country. Um, I mean, these are the same views that um, uh, our founding fathers had, same kind of views like Gary Johnson, who's running, has, who is well, a yeah. I mean, uh, even governor that is more qualified than, you know, Obama or... Well, the thing about and, I have is when it comes to the liberals and conservatives, I can see their point of view. It's just that when they say they will allow force over voluntary action, that's when they start to lose me. So I can work with people who care about the poor, care about the needy. I, I can work with you. But let's figure out real-world economic action that will work. You know, let's not have multi-generational yeah, poverty. And anything that's voluntary is stronger. I mean, if you can, like, for example, build that public option but make it voluntary, I would argue it would make that program that much stronger because these are people doing it because it's voluntary, um, because they want to do it, um, and um, they'll have more of a stake in it, too, and they'll be you oh, know, sure. pushing up with their Congress people a little bit more if, if that's the way it's going to be run. And um, so uh, anything that's voluntary, relationships that are voluntary, of course, we all know that, right? Well, exactly. this is a relationship with all of us together, and, I mean, you know, we, we, we're people. We don't want to be, like, led around, um, you know, and thrown in cages and stuff like that because we don't agree on something and, um, and want to live our life, um, you, you know, just as long as we don't harm other people. And, uh, and I think it's a good example. And, well, um, Joseph, it's been a pleasure. I, it's, I, I usually ask who some of your favorite people are, but, but you did mention Ron Paul, so I guess that's... Oh, yeah, I, Ron so. Paul, I, I like... Um um, our founder, I loved reading Jefferson. Like he was a flawed man in some aspects. I understand with the slavery, but you know what? He was tortured by it too. He was a person whose ideas are actually bigger than him. Yeah, they're <laughs> and, bigger than him. I mean, and, and he understood that, and that's why he you know, even he was tortured with his issue with slavery because, like, you know, I know it's wrong, but th this is how my business works, and how do I change my business? <laughs> business and stuff. So. Yeah, I agree with you, and that doesn't mean he's not a good writer and, and be able to, those ideas um, are, are are the ideas. They, they're not owned by, you, you know, the person who wrote them. Being able to discover the idea is great, and being able to actually live the idea, well, that's even greater. But, you know, not every person can be perfectly successful in that attempt because we're all flawed beings. But, but we can be, pre I mean, there were founding fathers who were, you know, abolitionists as well. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. And so I think it's a really interesting thing, but I, if you look at the general concepts of the founding fathers, they understand the problem with theocracy, they understood the problem with bankers, they understood the issue of what freedom really was about, and they understood um, foreign policy. You leave the world alone and just trade with them in peace. And if we get back to that, there is no limit to American prosperity and um, our, our respect in the world. I mean, we'll raise right up again because, you know, America was most loved when we didn't bomb everyone. <laughs> well, we're, we're, you, I mean, I, your ideas are the most qualified, and, um, and you sound like, you know, you're sincerely going to represent them. And, um, I mean, again, the Congress has a 10% approval rating um, pretty much um, this whole year. And uh, that's historical low. I mean, we really need Congress to represent that fact. I mean, it doesn't cost, this is the best investment you can make. I mean, you can invest in a stock market, which is rigged, or you could invest um, by not spending any money, um, just spreading the word and voting um, for uh, someone who's not a Republican or Democrat. I agree with you there. And, I do. Uh, well, Joseph, I, it, it's great talking with you. Um, and, um, you know, people need to check out your website, kexel2012.com, K-E-X-E-L. And uh, I, so I hope you have a good day. I'll say goodbye to you real quick after an interview if people want to know more. I, I mean, um, that's what to do. And, uh, and think of it also as a national thing. I mean, if you're not in Wisconsin, you might not have a Senate race going on in your state, but you want to support somebody and make an impact. Um, just think uh, November 7th, the day after Election Day. Um, you know, it could be it could be a shot heard around the world. Um, we don't, you know, need any more duds. So, uh, Joseph, thank you very much, and I'll thank you, Thomas. Appreciate it. Thanks.